Hey everyone, Blue Goblin here. Thank you for joining me for my comic book review for this week in November 2013. Uh, yeah, there's a, quite a bit to do in this particular video. Uh, before I get started with the comic book reviews, there's something I gotta discuss uh, concerning the whole Google Plus and YouTube bullshit. Okay, as it turns out, if you watched my my last back issue review on my Blue Goblin X channel, you know what I talked about. Now, over on my Blue Goblin X channel, I did a review of the last two parts of Lights Out. You know, the these books right here. Red Lanterns and the Green Lantern Annual. I reviewed those two books on my Blue Goblin X channel, and before I did that, I posted my thoughts and my feelings on the whole Google YouTube update that wasn't really necessary. And in that video I stated that, you know, I felt bad toward my subscribers because I was, I was, and to a certain extent I still am unable to reply to certain comments, to certain people's comments. Now I just found out ju not too long ago, not, actually not too long after I uploaded that video to YouTube that I am actually able to reply to comments again. Sort of. Here's the thing, and I spoke with my bu my buddy uh, Hulkland93, Malcolm Bennett, I spoke with him about this the other day on Facebook, and he was right on the money. Uh, it turns out, the only people I can reply to in the comment section on YouTube are the are people who didn't who also linked their accounts to Google people who it turns out and I actually looked this up and it's an actual fact people who don't link their Google Plus or whatever to their YouTube channel I can't reply to their comments but for those of you who did link I can reply to you and after I film this and after I get done filming this video I'm gonna go look back on some of the people who may have linked to see if I can reply to their comments and for those of you who I still can't do that for I am deeply sorry but I have been reading some of the comments that y'all have been you know laying on me here and it's for the most part it's positive giving me props giving me respect and I do thank you I mean I'm Deeply appreciative of everybody who posts their opinions on what I got to say or about the books I review, whether they agree or disagree with my opinion. As long as they don't troll on me, then I'm perfectly fine. You know, as like there have been plenty of times where I would re review a book and say that I absolutely loved it, and somebody would comment saying they hated the book, but they did like my review, and that that's perfectly fine. But let me just clear it up here. I can reply to some people, but some people I still can't. Now, I'm not telling you to link your Google page and your YouTube page together, because if you don't want to do it, then why should you? you know, if you're still able to post comments without doing it, then by all means, don't do it yet. Before YouTube and Google eventually force you to do it anyway, before you're able to do absolutely anything on YouTube. Um... But yeah, I just wanted to get that cleared up, and um, yeah, I, I still apologize to the people who I can't reply to, but I'm not going to force you to link if you don't want to link yet. Uh, there's also something else I need to say. I need to apologize to everybody at Dark Avenger Inc. Plus. I am way behind on doing reviews uh, for them. Um, I still have uh, issues of Savage Wolverine and Ultimate Spider-Man to review for that channel, and I promise I will try my best to get caught up with that, so please do not boot me out of the group, because I enjoy doing those reviews. The problem is finding the time to do them, because I'm sure a lot of people know that doing videos like this is not really as easy as it looks. You have to shoot the video, you have to get everything done in one take or more, you have to do the editing, you know, cut stuff out you don't want seen on camera. You have to put all the captions and your themes on if you choose to. Then you have to produce it and save it. And then you have to upload it to YouTube, which on the average for me takes about two to three hours to upload. So it's a tedious work, but it's a hobby that I still enjoy doing to a certain extent. 
but because of this whole Google YouTube crap it's not as enjoyable as it once was so yeah there is that and uh, also um, Jennifer and I are planning on doing some more videos for our Arkham Asylum studio channel here in the very very near future so stay tuned for that and go subscribe to Arkham Asylum studio you won't regret it it's just just me and her just being goofballs and just looking at stuff that we have or talking about stuff we like uh, we got three more videos in the planned right now and we'll get to work on those as soon as possible now on to the comic books all right I only got one Marvel I got one from Dynamite and the rest are all DC I'm gonna start with Marvel go through DC and then end with Dynamite now we're gonna start off with Marvel we're starting off with Amazing X-Men number one you knew I was gonna get this you knew hell just that damn cover alone is worth buying yeah Jason Aaron and uh, Ed McGinnis now I am a huge fan of Jason Aaron as a writer when it comes to X-Men his work with Bendis and Wood on Battle of the Atom was fantastic in my opinion so and you know Jason Aaron has been just killing it with Wolverine and the X-Men so I figured why not give this a try astonishing X-Men is sadly gone so we got amazing X-Men stepping in and this is part one of the search for Nightcrawler now you would assume by that cover that they instantly find him that's not the case this cover is a tease it is a really nicely done tease because they don't find Nightcrawler right off the bat in this issue minor spoiler there but I also got a comment on the team of X-Men we get in this book we get uh, by the looks on the cover we have Wolverine, Beast, uh, Northstar, Storm, Iceman, obviously Nightcrawler, and Firestar! Firestar! Angelica! She's back! A former Avenger, a cancer survivor, and now she's back and she's now working as a teacher in the Jean Grey school. A little, a little minor spoiler there, but this was fantastic stuff. And I love that, you know, Angelica, is, you know, is Angie. I call her Angie sometimes. But when she steps when she steps onto the campus ground, she's incredibly nervous about coming back to the, you know, coming back to the X-Men and everything. And it's like she steps in and it's like there's chaos all about. And it's over the smallest little stuff. It's like teachers and students having squabbles and everything. It's just good comedy this is where the comedy is at its best in this book is when is when Angie steps in the stuff with Nightcrawler it's he's um, he's in heaven and it's the place he's he, the place he's at the realm the realm beyond the flesh is what they call it in the beginning of the book but it's established that he's in heaven because he's kind of dead um, but yeah, it's like Nightcrawler, he said, this place is just as beautiful as I expect it to be and much more. And some other, uh, some other saved soul is sitting there telling him, but you still feel like there's a part, there's a chapter in your life that wasn't finished. And he says, yes, that's exactly how I feel. You know, because Nightcrawler met his unfortunate end during the Second Coming story, and he feels as much as I feel there was plenty more stuff to tell with him so it was really refreshing to see him again not as refreshing as not as refreshed as he was to see somebody actually trying to attack Kevin and he's he's excited he is excited he's like it's been too long since I've had a good sparring partner and I just love how he put it it was so great and so refreshing to see Nightcrawler fighting you know bamf 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 punch punch kick bamf that was so awesome to see again. Nightcrawler has always been one of my personal favorite X-Men, and to see him in action again like this, it was just a just a pure treat. I know we had to put up with the Age of Apocalypse Nightcrawler in Astonishing X-Men, and he was all right, but nothing compares to the one true Nightcrawler for me. Uh, the stuff with the there's a certain someone, and I know the cover spoils it. That's why I didn't take it out of the bag here because I don't want to ruin it but Kurt runs into a certain someone in heaven who's attacking and even though the cover 
and the internet has probably spoiled the ever-loving hell out of it, I still will not. And there's uh, some shenanigans going on with the little Banff creatures at the Jean Grey School, and there's something that they do in there, and it even brings out Beast's Rage, but in a humorous way. Very good stuff. It's just good dialogue upon good action upon good humor, good tension, good drama. This book had everything I could ask for in a simply fun read for an X-Men book. This was fun. And sometimes that's all you need when you read a comic book is to just simply have fun and enjoy it. And I loved the cliffhanger at the end. Very nice stuff. I can't complain. Was this perfect? No, but I loved it. I loved reading this. I had fun. I can't wait to see where they go with this. I am so thankful that I put this on my pull list because if Aaron and McGinnis continue to deliver like this, I'm hooked. Good stuff. Moving on to DC. We're starting DC off with Detective Comics number 24. Uh, 25, excuse me. 25. Uh, this is Detective Comics run into zero year. This deals with uh, James Gordon. And I gotta tell you, this actually was really good. And I like Detective Comics doing this from time to time. You know, even though it says Batman in Detective Comics, the one thing I really love about this series, even though it's Gotham City related, it doesn't always have to be about Batman. There have been plenty of issues where it's been about somebody else. In the past, so there, you, oh, even Batwoman had a small run in Detective Comics, and it was incredible. You know, and then there's also the Man Bat stories, which have been simply fantastic. And we're getting some. We're going to go back to some Man Bat storytelling, starting with this issue. Fantastic! I'm all for that. Give us some more Man Bat versus She Bat stories. This whole thing between Kirk and Francine Langstrom has been simply incredible storytelling, and I want DC to give us more of that in Detective Comics. Thank you for bringing these stories back in you know in the second half of the book. Fantastic stuff. But the first half of the book deals with Jim Gordon and how he had to deal with the police corruption in the Gotham City PD and. Oh my god, it's like the writers, it's like the creative team, John Lehman and Jason Fabok. It's like the writer, you know, John Lehman, it's like he went into overkill with this whole police corruption thing. It's, it just seemed like every page I turned, I saw more police corruption. It's like dirty cops or cops that were paid to look the other way and stuff like that. I think the writing, I think the storytelling went a little too much with that aspect. Just a little bit too much with it. But it still was an enjoyable read. It still painted a picture of Jim Gordon being that that Boy Scout with a gritty edge to him. You know he can, you know he can get down and dirty like the rest of the like the rest of the cops in Gotham. But he still believes in doing the job properly, and I loved that. I I usually get a kick out of it when you know we get a, a detective comics book or a Batman related book that focuses on Jim Gordon, who I believe is also one of the all-time big heroes of Gotham City, and I really appreciate that DC reminds us of that. It doesn't always have to be about Batman. This has been great stuff. I enjoyed this book. Very well done. You know, since it's a tie-in to Zero Year, it deals with how Gordon was able to help solve the police corruption stuff. You know, Batman was Brand, was a brand new idea, was a brand new uh, case with the Gotham City Police Department back then. Batman was a rookie vigilante at that time because this takes place six years ago. And I guess this kind of sort of tells the origin on how D Gordon came up with the idea of the bat signal. Um, for what it was, I enjoyed the hell out of it. It was a great read, and nice, nicely done. And like I said before, I'm really looking forward to more man bat and she bat stories. Great stuff. All right, all right, here it is. Now, I would love to talk about this book, but he's got something to say. You're up. Oh, 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 yeah. I could not wait to get on camera for this video. Could not wait. I was ready to do this. Let me tell you something. It doesn't 
It takes a lot to get me this pumped up, to get me this geeked out. I'm here to talk about this. Earth 2, number 17. Tom Taylor, the new writer for this series. God damn. Uh, just when I thought that James Robinson's departure from the series was monumental. This was fucking monstrous. I gotta say, from the bottom of my heart, I'm wowed and I'm impressed. What a motherfucking way to make your debut on a title. Tom, you impressed me. Uh, you, you did it. You impressed me. Now, let me try my best to talk about why I'm so hyped up on this book. First off, we get a humongous reveal at the beginning of the story. I'm not even going to spoil a damn thing about it. Just that part alone made my jaw drop. Then we get a tease about one of the wonders possibly being dead. I don't buy it for a damn minute. I'm ready to see this wonder rise up and come back and kick some more ass. Then we get to the stuff involving Superman. The stuff involving Superman was not only fantastic with the action, but there was a bit of logic to it. The wonders that are still standing come up with a plan to fight Superman. And once they put their plan into action, Superman just puts a halt to it. And he's like, y'all don't think I couldn't hear you talking about me in there? And I'm thinking to myself, of course, that makes perfect sense. Fantastic stuff. Big moment for Superman, not to mention the stuff that's going on with Batman. Oh my God, just one thing after another. This thing has just, this one particular issue has win after win after win after win. I couldn't get enough of it. Mr. Taylor, I'm going to be straight with you. I didn't expect much, because after the, the wonderful run James Robinson had with this series, I'll be honest, I didn't expect much, but goddammit, you impressed me, and I salute you for it. This was fucking amazing, and I can't wait to hear how many more people geek out about this book. Do yourselves a favor, if you been loving the Earth 2 series, if you love what James Robinson did for it, oh my god. Give Tom Taylor a chance. The way he started this issue, you damn right, he's gonna make an impact if he continues to write this series the way he wrote this issue right here. I can't say enough good things about it. Just win upon win upon win upon win. Loved it. Thank you, Tom Taylor. Thank you, Nicola Scott. Thank you, Trevor Scott. Thank you, DC Comics, for this wonderful beginning on the new writer for this wonderful series representing Earth 2 proudly. This was fucking amazing. Highly recommend it. I need a drink. Turn the fucking camera off. I gotta leave. Don't you just love he didn't sugarcoat it? But yeah with putting the overuse of that kind of language aside, yeah, I'm one to talk. Fantastic start to your to your run, Mr. Taylor. I and my Earth 2 dim-witted counterpart, we salute you. This was one hell of a way to make your first to make your first uh your first issue of Earth 2. Good job. Much respect. Moving along, we're going to 
Greenlander number 24, Courage Under Fire. Now, this is the beginning of the new status quo after the Lights Out storyline. Now, when I reviewed the Lights Out finale on my Blue Goblin X channel, I did my best not to spoil the ending. So, I would suggest you go watch that review before you come watch this one because I'm about to spoil what happened at the end of Lights Out. Now, Hal and the rest of the Green Lantern Corps have established their new home world. Spoiler, their new home world is Green Lantern Mogo. And like I said in my Blue Goblin X channel on my Lights Out review, when they discovered their new home planet and where they were going to make their new headquarters, I went, of course, that makes perfect sense. Since O was not around anymore, why not have a planet who is also a Green Lantern be your headquarters? That, that actually makes sense. Good stuff. But Hal makes a new directive that not only are they going to police the galaxy as they've always been, but now they're going to start policing other lanterns or people who misuse the emotional light spectrum which when you really listen to it it doesn't really make that much sense because hell it's even pointed out by other characters in this book what if it's somebody you know what if it's one of your friends or one of your people that you trust who start misusing the emotional light powers or what if it's you yourself you know, it, it just puts you in a really hypocritical, you know, puts your back against a hypocritical wall. It's like you're going to stop whoever misusing, you know, the light powers, even if it's maybe yourself or somebody you know or somebody you thought you trusted. It really, it really does honestly sound kind of dim-witted for how to make that kind of a declaration. But considering what they just went through with Relic, you can't honestly blame him for coming up with such a radical idea that might come back to bite him in the ass. Now, you know, I'm not saying it's a horrible idea, but it's got plenty of holes in it that could really come back to bite him, and I'm pretty sure it will. Um, but he's, he's going out looking for a specific star, Sapphire, who escaped the science cell just before Oa exploded and he's taking Kilowog with him as it's suggested with the cover but this little this little um, bounty hunt as it comes off to look like in here doesn't go so smoothly as he had predicted it would and by the end of the issue Hal and Woggy here they're in deep shit this was a good read I mean there were plenty of there were plenty of, of um, there were plenty of head scratching moments going okay why is he saying this why is he doing this there was plenty of that in here but for what it was it was an enjoyable read very nicely done uh robert venditti i give you a thumbs up it's it was a good read not the best in the world but it was a good read and i did enjoy it all right we're ending dc off with the movement number six gail simone about to you this was good very very good fighting for your future get a good look at that cover that cover is just majestic but um the story you know deals with the movement basically uh what i call inner tension there's there's tension within the group itself so much disagreements on how they should conduct their form of justice and no two are butting heads bigger than catharsis and tremor those two are like polar opposite tremor has her way of displaying justice catharsis has her way of uh of distributing justice and it just like they just can't get along on anything and even Tremors calling out the rest of the group saying, hey, we're supposed to be helping people. How good of a job are we actually doing? And you look at the rest of the characters interact with each other and you're thinking to yourself for just maybe a few seconds, oh my God, she's actually right. 
what really are they doing? All they've done is cause disturbances, maybe helped out a few civilians, you know, with, you know, minor crimes and maybe pissed off the police department. But what have they really done to help each other, you know, and stuff like that? And then comes the whole ordeal with uh, Burden. And man, was that some good stuff. Really dramatic action mixed with a little bit of comedy in there. And it's just just great stuff. The stuff with Mouse in here, I got to tell you, Mouse, that character is really starting to grow on me. And he really came off like a true underdog in this issue. Fantastic stuff. Just more and more goodness coming along here. And for now, it seems that the tension between Catharsis and Tremor has slowly died down to a temporary truce. But then we get to the cliffhanger. Holy shit. <laughs> this was good. Very, very nicely done. We also start to see, we also get to see more of Vengeance, Vengeance Moth's powers and okay, nice, very good. This was a solid read. I enjoyed the hell out of it. Really good stuff. Still not completely sold on Freddie Williams II's artwork in some places, but I can work with it. It's Gail Simone's writing. What more could I ask for? This is good stuff. Nicely done. Gail, I salute you. I bow to you, dear lady. This was great. All right, we're ending with Dynamite. We're going to end this review with Legends of Red Sonia, number one. Now, uh, with this book, this was something that Gail herself told me, that this was, so, this was a dream come true for her. You know, I asked her about it, and she simply put that this is something that she's been wanting to do for the longest time. And that's put, and that's get some of the best female writers in the comic book industry today and have them all team up together to write some awesome storytelling for Red Sonya in this miniseries. And here we have Gail, we have Nancy Collins, and Devin Grayson doing, uh, being the three head writers of this particular book. And you got artwork from Jack Jadson, Noah, Shalon uh, Noah Salonga, and Carla. Carlos Speed, uh, Carlos Speed McNeil, and I'm sorry if I butchered any of those names, uh, but yeah, this was good. I mean, the storytelling deals with these gray hunters who are hunting down Red Sonia, and the reason why I guess, I guess, now I'm just guessing at this point, the reason why it's called Legends of Red Sonia is they're looking for Red Sonia. Spoiler, spoiler alert. They're looking for Red Sonia, and they come across somebody who said she died a long time ago. Y'all are basically looking for a corpse. But the thing is, they're teasing that she might be actually be dead, and while they're hunting for her, they're reminiscing about legendary stories about Red Sonia and her past, you know, from her glory days and everything. And I'm like, okay, this could work. Where do we? How do we do this? So I read this, and I'm thinking to myself, wow, this stuff is really good. The stuff with the howling eyes of the god and everything, that was some good storytelling. We get to see how Sonya was both as a fighter and as a thief, as a warrior, as a hero. You know, if she is dead in this particular series, and they're using this miniseries to tell legendary stories about her, her about her glory days, I could be okay with that because this could be one of those special tribute series that pays simply pays tribute to the character rather than telling fresh new stories about about the character. Yeah, I know this seems like a fresh new idea. But you're talking about stories that celebrated her past and celebrated her heyday and her glory days. This could really do something for the character of Red Sonia. And it shows a true sign of respect from everybody who's working on this series. And for that, it's really refreshing and I actually approve of it. Now, if they come along later in the series and say that she didn't actually die and she was just speculated to be dead, I'd be okay with that too. As long as the writing is solid and the storytelling gets paced very well, it could go very, it could go either way and I would be satisfied as a reader. This is really nicely really nicely written. The cover is damn awesome. I want that cover on a frame hanging somewhere on my wall. This has been uh, this was really good. It's just amazing to see how many people love to tell stories 
about Sonya in this book, and most of the people who tell the stories are people she's pissed off. And it's just wow. And you know, and when somebody when somebody who Sonya has pissed off tells a story about how she was, you know they might exaggerate one or two things. And I guess that's one of the most intriguing things about the storytelling in here. It's just really nicely handled. But I don't have to just salute Gail for this. I need to salute Gail, Nancy, and Devin for their brilliant writing with this first issue. This was actually better than I thought it was going to be. So I'm happily, uh, I'm happily pleased with this first issue. Don't know how the rest of the the rest of the miniseries is going to fold out, but I'm sure as hell ready to see where it can go. So to everybody. Not just the writers and the artists, but to everybody who's working on this series. So far, we're one issue in, and I'm already happy. Thank you very much. This was really good. All right. That's all I got for this week, everybody, and the sun's fixing to finally come out. <laughs> I want to thank you all for watching. And, again, please give me patience with the whole replying to comments thing. If I can reply to you, then I will try my best to find a way to do it and you know let you know hey if you give me props I can at least say thank you to some of you and to and like I said again for those of you who I can't say thank you to I am sorry but I'll say it right now for everybody who I can't reply to if you gave me props from the bottom of my heart I thank you and I would hope that you keep posting your comments you keep posting your opinions let me know what you thought of my reviews let me know what you thought about the books I talked about whether your opinion is almost like mine or whether your opinion differs from mine but you still like the book or maybe you didn't like the book I want to know what you thought post your post your comments post your opinions like I said as long as you don't troll on me I'm happy tell me what you thought what did you think about these books any of these books I talked about, if you read these books, what did you think? Let me know. Uh, like I said, subscribe to this channel. I just reached over a thousand subscribers on this channel. Fuck yes, I'm over a thousand subscribers and I'm happy. I thank everybody who subscribes and I'm going to thank everybody who will subscribe from here on in. Subscribe, please. You won't regret it, I promise you. I'm the greatest goblin that ever lived, God damn it. And go subscribe to my Blue Goblin X channel. Don't forget about Dark Avenger Inc. Plus. My bro, my student, one of my best friends, the Mount Vernon kid. Mark and Chloe at Fat Stack of Comics. Deadpoolzilla, Brandon Hex, two of my oldest buddies from YouTube. Uh, go check out Brandon Hex's channel. He just did a whole uh, video retrospect of Battle of the Atom. It is fucking awesome. Go check it out. Uh, Deadpoolzilla, uh, last time I looked, he talked about sad, the sad end of Mark Wade's run on Daredevil. Uh, uh, and don't forget about Jennifer and, me, and I doing that, uh, stop doing our thing on Arkham Asylum Studio. Check that out, by the way. Thanks again for watching, everybody. And until next time, I will see you all later.